I want to tell you about uh, a design build test um, exercise that we have been running at Lancaster University for some years now, and it's evolved a bit over the years. Lancaster, incidentally, is in the northwest of England, about 100 kilometres north of Manchester. Everybody knows where Manchester is. Everybody knows where Liverpool is too, <laughs> yes. It's north of Liverpool, absolutely right. Um, I should say at the outset that at the end of this presentation I have to leave fairly promptly to get a plane. <laughs> so um, I've put my email address on the last slide if anyone wants to ask any further questions so that um, uh, I can address them if you, if you would like me to. So uh, what I intend to cover um, in the next 20 minutes is, uh, first of all, talk about the engineering context of, of this particular topic, then the task that we set to the student teams, uh, what technology we, uh, there is in it, some pictures of students doing it, a bit more uh, technology stuff, what does it cost, and then conclusions. Uh, another thing I should say is that um, this project lasts five weeks, um, and if essentially it takes five afternoons, so it's quite uh, short. It's not a, a kind of whole semester or anything like that. Uh, we run a number of projects of this length, so this is just one. Um, I thought I'd better put in something about context, having listened to Ed Crawley on Monday, saying that you know, it's no good not explaining what the context is of things. And... Uh, I I feel that slightly as though I'm bringing coals to Newcastle by talking about wind turbines in Denmark, which I know is the dominant nation in the wind turbine industry. Um, I mean, Britain used to make quite a lot of wind turbines, but now we don't make any uh, because we've been, uh, that the industry has been always taken over by Denmark as far as we're concerned. But I would also say that there was a question asked, I think, about universities that have wind turbines. We are in the process of installing one at Lancaster. And we would have installed two if we could have got, got planning permission, but it was knocked down to one by our local council. Anyway, the context I think everybody knows is that there are many wind turbines installed already. Many more are being installed. Um, they're almost all horizontal axis windmills, if you like. There are very few vertical axis wind turbines. And the technology has advanced enormously over the past 30 years, and as far as I can tell, it's still going on. Um, I'm sure our colleague from Vestas this morning would confirm that, that uh, they're getting bigger, they're getting taller, they're producing more energy. And so it, it's quite an interesting subject from an engineering point of view. So this is the task that we set the students, very briefly stated. <clears throat> they work in teams. We would quite like them to work in teams of two because they do more things then, um, more of the engineering, I mean. But uh, there were just too many students this year. We've just finished this, incidentally, this year. And they design and build a small wind turbine rotor. The maximum diameter is 200 millimetres, so it will fit into the wind tunnel without getting too near the sides. We provide them with standard hubs, and uh, we asked them to design it to perform as well as possible in terms of getting power out of the wind compared with what there is in it and not be expensive either. Um, so what, what, are, what is the technology that we can teach them through this medium? Um, it's, there's some very basic stuff. You know, how much power is there in the wind? It's just a matter of the kinetic energy flowing through the diameter that we're talking about. That's what's available. And how much can we capture? Well, you certainly can't capture all of it. If you captured all of it, the wind would have stopped. Well, clearly, it's got to keep moving, so you can't get all. And uh, Betts showed about it, uh, 80 years ago, I think it was, that you can only get 59% as the absolute maximum. So um, that's what you can get. And we want uh, the students to aim to get as much of that as they can, a larger proportion of the bets limit as they possibly can. Um, but they have a lot of things that they can decide. Um, they can have a large number of blades or a few. 
and the more blades there are, the lower the tip speed ratio can be, the slower it can go, because uh, if, you, if you have it go very slowly with a small number of blades, of course the wind goes through the gaps in between them without delivering any energy. So um, <coughs> it's no good having few blades and going slowly. Equally, it's no good having a lot of blades and going quickly because the wake of one interferes with the next. So there is a kind of optimum. So, but they can choose. They can choose how many blades to have, what the tip speed ratio should be, what shape the blades should be. Um, I think all of them use a knacker for aerofoil shape, but there's a lot of scope within that. It can have different camber, different thickness in relation to the cord, different cord. So there's quite a lot of choice that students can make in their team. And what angle should the blades be at? Well, that involves relative velocity because the tip goes very quickly, the middle goes rather slowly, and so the angle, the, the apparent angle with which the air approaches the blade is different according to the radius. So it's quite an interesting problem involving relative velocities and things which I fancy they haven't actually covered at school nowadays. It's very hard to tell what they're doing at school, but um, I don't think they've done relative velocity, it seems to me. Um, so they have a number of design decisions they can make. These, these are basically them. <coughs> and uh, I think other people have mentioned this week, um, or the, over the past couple of days, <coughs> that students coming from school, and these are first-year students, so they, don't, they haven't done a lot at the university at this stage, they have a bit of difficulty making design decisions in a kind of uh, space which has a lot of dimensions to it. And they could make all sorts of decisions with these various parameters. And they tend to say to us, well, you know, where are the equations? What do we do? And it's not like that, of course. You know, you've got to just say, shall we go for a high tip speed ratio with a small number of blades or a, a low tip speed ratio with a large number of blades? It's their, their decision. They make their mind up. They can choose whether to have you know, a large cord or a short one. There are, there are reasons to dis decide these things, but it's their decision. And I must say, they have a bit of difficulty with this, some of them. Um, and I think, who was the speaker this morning who was talking about this? Paul Fisher, I think, was saying that uh, the same thing happens in his informatics project where it's not totally defined. People have to make decisions and they find it a bit difficult if it's not obvious what they should do. But later, once they've done that, bitten the bullet, made the decisions and had a successful outcome, they find it very satisfying. And I think the same goes for us with this project, in most cases anyway. So here's a bit about the blade twist. Um, this is the uh, velocity triangle here. This is the wind coming this way. This is because of the rotation, the blade is going this way. And so the relative velocity between them is this vector here, although it seems to be the wrong way around to me. But anyway, that's the uh, uh, blade velocity relative to the wind, I think, rather than vice versa. So it's a little bit opposite to what I would have drawn. I didn't draw this triangle, I may say. But it's at that angle. And because you need an angle of attack, um, and the wind is actually going this way, I should say. Um, the, the blade has to have an angle alpha, which is the angle of incidence. Whoops. Um, so uh, that's the angle of incidence. This is the angle of the blade. And this uh, curve here shows how the angle of the blade varies with radius. So it goes from potentially uh, nearly 60 degrees there down to almost zero at the tip. In fact, in some cases, and again, they found this a bit. They find this a bit surprising. The blade angle at the tip goes negative if you've got a high-speed blade. It looks as though it shouldn't work, but of course it does. It just goes rather fast. Um, so that's one of the calculations they have to do. Here's some photographs showing students actually doing it. Here they are uh, doing a CAD model of the blade. Um, as I mentioned, I think that we have uh, we give them a standard hub. And uh, this, is the, this is the end fixing which fits into the, fits into the hub, uh, which is a standard thing we give them on SOLIDWORKS to attach. And then they, they produce the blade profile, including the twist, um, using SOLIDWORKS, which is the package we use. 
Um, here's the model blades being produced. We do this by additive manufacture now. This is something we introduced a couple of years ago. Um, so we, we have three additive manufacturing machines, but we, we do these in ABS normally. Um, so, oops, sorry. Keep going back. There we are. Here are the uh, blades coming out of the machine. And these are a couple of uh, platens with, a sit with sets of blades on, which covers a number of students. Okay, so we, we put all the designs together and make several at once. Um, here they are with an assembled rotor, um, just balancing it. Here um, it's just static balanced. Uh, there's a shaft there on knife edges. And they, a, a great advantage of doing it with additive manufacture is that it's a reasonably accurate process and the blades are reasonably well balanced to start with. When we did them by hand, we had great difficulty because uh, uh, always one blade would be slightly heavier than the other or a bit bent or something, and it was very hard to balance them. Um, that's an example of a finished rotor. You can see the, the hub in the middle there, which is a piece of uh, PVC rod with three holes in it. In this case, it's a three-blade rotor, and here are the three blades there. As I say, they're 200 millimeter diameter or thereabouts. And here are some students doing uh, a test in the wind tunnel. Um, we have a little prony brake there at the back. You can't see it, but the cord goes over the top of the uh, drum there and down this sh hollow shaft here, or hollow stand. And there are some weights hanging down there so that we can apply torque to it. Um, Another thing students said this year was this is a crude method of applying torque. Well, I think it's an excellent way of applying torque. What could be better? You just have two weights and you find the difference between them. Um, they seem to think you ought to have a generator or something, which I think would be a nightmare because there'd be so much friction. So um, you know, they don't appreciate good ideas when they see them sometimes. Um, and here's a view looking along the wind tunnel. That was taken... Um, in natural light, and I did it again with a flash. Whoops, sorry. There it is with flash. It's the same thing, but of course it stops uh, the wind turbine. You can just see the, uh, um, the sort of haze of, of the thing actually rotating. There's a bit more about what the technology is in it. They, f they find out a bit about instrumentation, for example, the prony brake. To measure the speed, uh, we used to use. Um, a stroboscope, which I thought was a good way, but now we have a little sensor, a non-contacting sensor, to give us an indication of each revolution. Uh, we have to allow for friction loss in the bearings. Um, we get them to present their results in dimensionless form, that is the tip speed ratio and the power coefficient, which enables them to scale it up to a larger size. So we, we could say, well, how much could you capture in a wind of different speed from a turbine of different size? And uh, I'm not sure that they fully take that on board, all of them. But not many people do, to be honest, do they? I think many people find scaling up from one size to another using dimensionless ratios is a bit difficult, perhaps, or advanced or something. But I mean, it's such a good technique. And then I, it isn't exactly the technology, but they have to write a report on this, which is an individual report for each one, each student. Um, the costs of it. Obviously, there are staff costs, base costs. And I don't know if any of you were at the presentation by the people from Aston University in the UK on Monday morning. Or was it yesterday morning? Yesterday morning. Uh, they were complaining they didn't have any space. Well, we've always had space, I'm glad to say. We're quite fortunate in that respect. And recently, we acquired these uh, additive manufacture machines, which is very, very useful for all sorts of projects. And so we had to buy the ABS powder, but that's about it. And as far as costs go, we, we, we include in the assessment some credit for making a, a rotor which is economical, doesn't use much powder, and uh, they have to pay some marks if they make a very expensive one with great big heavy blades. And we tell them in advance what the algorithm is, so you know, it doesn't come as a surprise. Um, I've got some blades here which I'll just, or rather rotors here which I'll just wave about. Um, 
that's a hub. This is a, a two-blade rotor. A three and a little four. There's another two here. And this, this was from last year, actually, is a one-blade rotor, uh, which has to go very fast. But it has to have a counterbalance, of course, to... Uh, <laughs> smiling, please. Um, how are we doing? OK. Um, that's the costs. Um, so uh, <coughs> student feedback on this this year was a little bit mixed. I think most students enjoyed the project. They liked doing it. But just a few didn't really like the fact that when we started off, they, we didn't tell them what to do. You know, they said, these are the things you have to decide. And uh, I suppose not unreasonably, they said, well, on what basis? And um, we didn't really answer the question completely. We said, well, you've just got to make a decision and go with it, you know. But they found it a bit uncomfortable. So I think perhaps next time we should point out to them that in engineering projects you've got to make some decisions, usually with inadequate information. That's just, you know, it's what life is like, isn't it? You're always making decisions with inadequate information. What job shall I take? Or so forth. You know, you never know how it's going to pan out. So I think they need to, to learn that. And in conclusion, then, we think this is an effective in exercise. There are positive learning outcomes. And I think that I think there really are. Um, I, I could judge that from the reports that students write because they seem to have gained quite a large level of understanding of the technology in the project, to me. I mean, they were able to um, use the dimensionless ratios to predict behaviour or performance of a larger wind turbine, for example. They knew how to use the prony brake. They had worked out how to do it and so forth. So I think they gained a lot from it. Um, they had to consider cost and they had to make design decisions in a difficult, un ill-defined situation. I think it was, it was a useful exercise in my opinion. We've run it for some years. It's evolved slowly and I think we intend to go on running it for some years. Just, you know, it's gradually moving on. So, uh, in conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge the, uh, the co-authors of the paper and, of course, the lab technicians who did um, the work in the wind tunnel, or some of the work, the students did the work, but set up the, the wind tunnel, uh, did the additive manufacture for us, and, of course, the students also, um, who it was good to work with, I think. And that's my email address if anybody wants to know more, because uh, I'm going to have to dash off fairly soon. <laughs>